host John Bruni. Welcome to The Focus, where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world. Each episode, we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time. Join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world, where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community. Well, audience, uh, the last three weeks has been pretty awesome. As you may recall, I was invited to participate in a high-level uh, international panel on the Middle East in Warsaw, Poland, courtesy of the Polish Institute of International Affairs for their Strategic Arc conference series. And as a consequence of my participation, I was invited to speak on Polish TV on the recent Shangri-La Security Dialogue in Singapore. So, wow. <laughs> but now that I'm resettled back home, jet lag free, I thought I'd kick off the focus with the return of a great friend of our podcast, New York Times bestseller and Frank D. Baird Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University, Avi Loeb. It's been roughly a year since we spoke to Avi. When we spoke to him last, you may recall that he just returned to Boston from his Silver Star expedition and his successful gathering of spherules from an interstellar object off the coast of Papua New Guinea in the waters off Manus Island. A lot has happened in the area of UAP investigations over the past 11 months. Disclosure may still be a faraway country, but the dogged determination of people like Avi to uncover the truth, whatever that may be, is an exciting human endeavor. But before we start, a shameless plug for ourselves. Please subscribe to our channel. We need the algorithm to help find us, and by hitting the subscribe and like buttons, this is your contribution to the growth of what hopefully will become a South Australian global sensation. Avi, welcome back to The Focus. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure, as always. Thank you. Avi, you've recently been to Europe, firstly to the Munich Security Conference in Germany and then to Turon, Poland. Can you tell our audience what brought you to these places? Uh, well, the organizers of the Munich Security Conference decided to invite a scientist and so they asked if I'm willing to discuss space. And I, of course, agreed that it's a very prestigious event that brings together the top politicians from around the world, the heads of state. And uh, when I got there, um, I we went to the rooftop um, uh, of the building. It's a hotel where uh, we had some drinks. But uh, I noticed around me there were um, snipers with the black <laughs> head covers. And... Uh, they were not there to protect me. No. They were there well, to protect uh, Kamala Harris, uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, and other dignitaries that were there. And uh, I then realized that speaking about the extraterrestrials is not as risky as being a politician. Interesting. Uh, Did any of them come up to you and say, oh, Avi, um, I've got some information for you that you may want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> no, that didn't happen, but a lot of people are interested in the research mm -hmm. I'm doing, and they approached me and yeah. talked with me, uh, and uh, it was a 45-minute session that uh, of, of Q&A that uh, is available on video, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from there, I was invited by the Polish government to uh, visit uh, Turun, Poland, uh, the birthplace of Nicolaus Copernicus. Uh, they celebrated 550 years for his uh, birth and invited me to give a keynote lecture. And uh, as we all know, uh, Copernicus realized that uh, the sun is probably at the center of the solar system rather than the earth. And uh, uh, I decided to title my presentation, The Next Copernican Revolution, where mm -hmm. we will not only uh, know that um, we're currently not at the center, the physical center of the universe, we are also not at the intellectual center of the universe. That was the focus of my talk that we are not alone. There might be an intelligence out there that may be even superhuman uh, and um, how to find it, scientifically speaking. So that's what I talked about. But in the process uh, of visiting the place, well, first of all, I was given by the governor of the region. I was given a, a, a 
copy of the book of uh, Copernicus, the revolutionibus that uh, summarized his findings. Uh, and uh, I was told that uh, he was actually a priest uh, that didn't want to rock the boat. He wanted to help the church and the church had a problem. They could not figure out when Easter takes place to better than a few days uh, because they use the model in which the earth is at the center. And so what Copernicus did is look at the data and he realized that if you put the sun at the center, uh, you end up with a much better prediction for the timing of Easter. And the church said, thank you very much. This is uh, very helpful. We'll use this model. But we all know that this is just theory, that in reality, the earth is at the center. And they banned his book. It was a forbidden book until the 19th century. Uh, but I salute uh, the integrity of Copernicus. He obviously didn't want to rock the boat, even though sometimes when the boat is heading in the wrong direction, you must rock it. There is no other choice. Um, but um, uh, and he saw the publication of his book only on his deathbed. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, if he were to behave like most scientists today, uh, you know, that basically want to please their peers and just say whatever everyone else is saying. If he wanted to act this way, he would have said, well, you know, there are uncertainties in the data. We all know that the earth is at the center. Uh, let's not, uh, you know, try to deviate from the beaten path. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you would find many scientists today that would subscribe to that uh, approach because the church is saying one thing and we all know that the church is right and let's continue to maintain the current view and just raise enough dust so that we claim that we can't see anything. But, you know, Copernicus founded modern science in the sense that he respected the data more than the prejudice. And that's a very important lesson. Now, the difference between him and Galileo was that Galileo did rock the boat. And the evidence is that he was put in house arrest. And uh, uh, he basically argued the same, but using different evidence, that the moons of Jupiter. But at any event, um, you know, the scientific approach is supposed to be founded on curiosity without uh, having opinions to start with. But I mean, obviously, you can have opinions that motivate you, but then um, eventually you surrender to whatever the data shows. And, you know, that's a very difficult thing to do even nowadays. Uh, and I was very pleased to, to have those two visits uh, back to back. And um, uh, of course, they had the very different nature. Uh, Avi, I just had a look at your office, and for those of you in the audience who can see, is uh, the revolutionibus in the just over yes, your it's shoulder, just behind, me. Just exactly. behind you? Yes, yes. I, yes, because I actually did my research and I had a look at the leather-bound copy, which I have to say, congratulations on it. I mean, it's it's such an honor, but it's a it's a it's a very handsome volume. Let me let me tell you. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's behind me, and you know, the, the books are a treasure because they. they contain a record of important insights uh, from people that haven't that, that are not around anymore and you know that that is an important lesson that can be extended to interstellar space that we can recover objects that uh, record knowledge that we don't possess and uh, even if the sender is dead you know we would feel that we are not alone uh, you know by having copernicus in our distant past history i feel that you know, I'm not alone in, in trying to open up a new frontier for research. Avi, a lot of things have happened in the field of UAP research since we last spoke. Firstly, what conclusions have been discovered from the spherules you dredged up from the Pacific? I mean, have we any definitive evidence that A, they are of interstellar origin and B, that they are of artificial origin? Right. So um, it took us nine months to analyze uh, those uh, spherules. We, all together, we had about 850 of them, uh, and uh, we used three laboratories. Um, shortly after we came back, we uh, used the laboratory of um, material uh, science at um, the UC Berkeley. Uh, and then I brought most of the materials to my colleague at Harvard, uh, Stein Jacobson, who is uh, a world-renowned uh, geochemist. Uh, and uh, we used state-of-the-art instrumentation, mass spectrometers, uh, electron microprobe to image those ferals. And we also had a very important help from the Brucker Corporation in Germany, Berlin, 
in a laboratory led by Roald Tuggle, where he had an X-ray fluorescence analyzer that basically could examine the spherules without doing anything to them, just by X-raying them. Uh, and that helped us uh, identify at least the materials on the surface of the spherules. And from there, we went to the uh, mass spectrometer in Stein Jacobson's lab at Harvard. Uh, so altogether, it took us nine months to go through the analysis. And I should say that, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but uh, during the same time that, well, actually, when I brought the materials from the expedition, there was a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal arguing that the sensors aboard U.S. government satellites that provided the information about the location and the existence of this interstellar meteor, uh, that they were wrong, that in fact, um, they overestimated the speed by a factor of two. This is, a, otherwise you cannot feed the data with a stone, a stony meteorite that came from the solar system. So those people used this, a, a model for stony meteorites from the solar system and said that therefore the data must be wrong. And, uh, you know, that's a very arrogant statement to make on two counts. First of all, the U.S. Space Command looked back at the data and issued a, a, an official letter to NASA that uh, indicates that it's interstellar in origin based on the high velocity of the object that, that cannot be bound by gravity to the sun. Okay, so they went back to the data, looked at it, and issued the letter. And then these ast uh, astrophysicists basically saying, you know, we don't believe you. We don't trust you. You are wrong. Uh, and um, that's arrogant uh, because, you know, the U.S. Space Command is funded at $30 billion, more than the budget of NASA, to alert the U.S. president of any ballistic missiles that may be fired by, you know, North Korea, China, Russia. So they are a serious organization and they collected data from satellites and they analyzed it and they, you know, reported about it twice. And um, you know the second uh, our, uh, point of arrogance is that um, you know those those uh, people uh, put the paper the, they published the paper when I was heading back with the materials from the site, and um, you know to to make a statement that this is not interstellar when we have the materials instead of just waiting for us to analyze the materials is again quite arrogant. They know the answer in advance. That's what I meant that scientists nowadays would have sided with the church. The church says everything falling from the sky must be stones. And so we say that everything falling from the, the sky is solar system stones. And um, I should say that before 1803, you know, scientists ridiculed the poss possibility that stones fall from the sky. They said it's impossible. They're only on the ground. And then there was a meteor shower in Liège, France, that convinced scientists. Indeed, there were so many eyewitnesses that said, we saw it and they recovered materials and that convinced the scientific community that stones can fall from the sky. And now, you know, they just want, they insist that only stones fall from the sky, nothing else. And uh, again, it's a lack of open-mindedness. And we're talking about, you know, down to earth things, stones, rocks. Uh, mm -hmm. objects, uh, you know, it's not about the extra dimensions in string theory, which, by the way, is not criticized much. So when people, <laughs> yeah. when you find the mainstream uh, theoretical physicists talking about speculative notions that, you know, we don't have a chance in our lifetime to, to test, mm -hmm. uh, that's completely legitimate and fair. But when we deal with objects falling from the sky, it must be solar system. Um, anyway, so um, we came back with the materials analyzed and and then the same group of people criticized and said that we must have found coal ash, which wow. is very common on Earth. So we checked 55 elements from the periodic table and demonstrated it's not coal ash. And I should say that even the editor of the journal where I submitted this report that it's not coal ash, he accepted for publication the statement that it is coal ash, but had difficulties accepting the evidence that it's not coal ash. And I found that really surprising because it shows prejudice even on the, you know, at the level of an editor. But how can and they actually, I'm sorry, how can they actually do that when the evidence is clearly pointing in another direction? I mean, well, so here is what the editor, I, I can tell you what the editor wrote to me. He said, hmm. oh, I completely forgot that I accepted the other paper. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, um, but he had difficulties publishing the evidence 
that it's actually not collage. And, and so then uh, a few months later, the same group of people decided to write a paper with a few other, other people that uh, actually the meteor was a truck. I remember and, that. Yep. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, that appeared in newspapers because they said, well, you know, um, uh, we don't believe the U.S. government data. Mm -hmm. And we look at the uh, uh, seismometer data from Papua New Guinea and infrasound data from other places. And it's not good data. In fact, the Papua New Guinea seismometer actually may have been a truck. And uh, those other uh, data sets give a very large error box uh, for the position of this meteor. So they may have gone to the wrong place. And in fact, it could have been a truck. And <laughs> I replied to that. <laughs> I replied to that. And I wrote to the editor, to, to the editor of uh, the New York Times. I said, how can you report about it when you're not checking the facts? You know, how can I believe what you publish in the context of politics if, if in, in the context of science, you don't attend to the facts? And the facts are that we relied on the flash of light uh, f from the uh, explosion of the of this object, from uh, that released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy, a truck does not produce a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy, yeah, and that was the light detected by the U.S. government satellites. Now, the mere fact that these people refer to a meteor must rely on the report by the government. So they accept the existence of the report, but nevertheless, they, they say the velocity measurement was wrong, the location was wrong. So why do you accept one thing and not accept the other things? Just because you want to step on any flower that rises above the grass level because you are not involved in the detection? Anyway, I was just so about to say, I was just about to say, I, I, I sense that there's a lot of professional envy out there because, you know, when you have created your career and you dig yourself into a particular dogmatic mindset, you will not pull yourself out under any circumstance. Yeah. So the good news is I'm not in house arrest. I just joined <laughs> at sunrise this morning. And moreover, there is a huge fan base. You know, just uh, yesterday I, I had a meeting with um, uh, uh, Nicolas uh, Bergrun, uh, who is a a multi-billionaire that is interested in philosophy. And he came out of the blue and he said he saw the work that I'm doing, just wanted to speak with me, to have lunch with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and just two days earlier, I was invited to give a, a, a lecture to a high-tech um, group of entrepreneurs and startup uh, 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 in, uh, uh, initiators and um, uh, in, in Berlin, Germany. And a lot of people came to me afterwards. There was a reporter that interviewed me. And then on the way to go to speak with a the reporter, there were two people that stopped me and wanted me to sign a copy of my book and said that they really, uh, you know, follow my work uh, all the time. And, and um, you know, just, um, uh, uh, for example, a, a, a few days before that, um, uh, I was told that in Spain, I, my, I'm the most known scientist right now, uh, and my work is featured in all the newspapers all the time. And my essays, which are published on medium.com, are translated to Spanish. So altogether, you know, there is a, a huge amount of positive response. It comes mostly yeah. from curious people but um, and people that have common sense. But unfortunately, common sense is not common in academia. <laughs> and there are some uh, people who are trying to bully uh, any... Uh, you know, study that goes out, uh, outside the box. And, uh, and and that is really unfortunate because it's, I'm sure it's not only in my context, but it's in many other contexts. And, and it slows down the rate of progress because, you know, new knowledge does not fall into our lap. We have to do a lot of work. And in these cases, it was two years to plan the expedition, to go there, to do the work, and then to analyze the materials. And it's very easy to have an opinion, but you can have an opinion, but why would you try to uh, basically ridicule the, the, the research and, and, and bring up issues that are not real? Why would you actively get engaged in trying to bring it down? And that is really unfortunate. It shouldn't happen because we all should be curious. At any event, uh, we wrote a very extensive paper detailing the um, the results. Um, we submitted it in uh, February. 
2024 and uh, it has been uh, reviewed and uh, uh, I should say uh, the reviews were very professional mm -hmm. and uh, I was very pleased by that. It was not this group of people as we were talking about. Uh, and um, so we replied to each and every comment and now we are waiting uh, to hear for uh, for the next iteration. That's usually the way it goes with scientific papers. Yeah. Uh, and um, and then we are planning the next expedition because what we found, let me just summarize what the finding is, um, that we found that 10% of the spherules, about 80 of them, have a chemical composition that is unlike anything previously reported from solar system materials. So it doesn't resemble the crust of the Earth, doesn't resemble the Moon, the uh, Mars, um, asteroids. Uh, it looks different. Uh, and uh, if you compare, for example, the uh, composition of, we, we did it for 60 elements from the periodic table, there are many that uh, deviate from the standard solar composition uh, by up to a factor of a thousand. Elements like beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. And you know, uh, just last week, I compared these findings to the results from um, the asteroid Bennu that was um, uh, approached by OSIRIS-REx, a mission that NASA sent at $800 million cost uh, to collect materials and return them back to, to Earth. And uh, they collected uh, more than 100 grams, 120 grams or so of material. We just had about uh, tens of milligrams. Uh, so they collected more than 100 grams and, and examined. And, and you know they have very similar types of tools that they used and, and types of diagrams or, or, image, or, or plots that they make, very similar to the ones we have in our paper. And I mm -hmm. compared the findings. So they find from the asteroid Bennu, which came from the inner part of the uh, asteroid belt, the main asteroid belt around the sun at a few times the Earth-Sun separation, um, they find that um, the, the abundance of uh, all the elements they looked at is very close to the standard solar composition within a factor of two or three. That's it, it's, wow. it, it's, it's, it's just on top of it. And what we found is up to a factor of a thousand what? for some elements. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> that that is a clear difference. And um, so to us, it indicates that, uh, an unusual origin that is uh, potentially from outside the solar system for those particular, we call them Belau spherules that for beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium. And right. so this is a completely independent uh, line of uh, evidence than the speed of the object being above the escape speed from the solar system for an interstellar origin. And uh, it could be a natural origin. It could be artificial. We don't know because these ferals are less than a millimeter in size. Yeah. And uh, of course, the next step is to go again and collect bigger spherules now or bigger uh, pieces of mm -hmm. the of the object because the, the small spherules they lost volatile elements so we don't have a full census of the composition and moreover we can't examine the material properties because it's just molten droplets that mm -hmm. lost the original structure so we want to find bigger pieces and from that infer uh, something about the nature of the object uh, it could be natural uh, I wrote a paper just a few months ago, so, and it's now uh, published, that uh, says that, um, you know, in principle, a planet like the Earth, if it comes close to the most common type of stars, uh, dwarf stars, that they are 10 times less massive than the sun and 10 times smaller in size than the sun. So altogether, they are 100 times denser than the sun, the most the most common stars are very dense, 100 times denser than the sun. So if a rock, a planet like the Earth passes near them, uh, they can spaghettify it because they're much denser than rock, those most common stars. And mm -hmm. so they would, they would tear it apart and you would end up with a stream of rocks, half of which will be ejected to interstellar space mm -hmm. as a result of this spaghettification of, of, of the planet. And, uh, and that could lead to the unusual chemical composition uh, that we found because um, you melt the rock uh, close to the star and, and as a result of this melting, some elements are uh, removed. Uh, they are sinking uh, and other elements are left on the crust of the, of the planet. And so, 
So that's a natural uh, potential origin, but but we don't know because we didn't get the big enough pieces to figure out the nature of the object. And so we are currently planning an expedition, uh, hopefully within the coming year to collect bigger pieces. It would be more expensive, uh, about six and a half million dollars. We're currently looking for a funder. So if anyone is listening that might be interested in being on the ship or being the first to know what, what we find, uh, please contact me. Uh, it will be very exciting. Well, let's put it this way. If I win Cross Lotto, Avi, I'll give you a call because I want to be on that ship. I should just mention that we will plan. We will use um, uh, a, a sort of like a robot, a, a, a remotely operated vehicle that we would place on the ocean floor, two kilometers deep, uh, that would um, give us a, a video feed uh, of what we are looking at. Uh, previously, we just blindly collected materials with magnets from the ocean yeah. floor, but but yeah. now we will be able to pick up uh, objects in real time, and um, that's why it's more expensive. I'm just wondering, you know, if we play that whole. Um reverse alternative reality kind of game at the moment. It, say, for instance, Elon Musk's Roadster that he launched back in, when was that? A, a few years ago. Uh, 2018. It was 28, um, in 2018. 2018. Yeah. Okay. So that thing has hit a certain velocity. It's been given about five to 10 million years being in outer space, being pitted by micrometeorites, being bombarded by interstellar radiation. You know, 10 million years hence, it won't look like the Roadster as it was launched into space. It'll look eh, sort of different, kind of, you know. That's right. Right. It will lose so, probably a lot of its uh, um, uh, color. I mean, it will not be red anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly, exactly. So, and, and, so, and, but... and, 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 and if it, you know, some astronomers calculated that it will probably collide with Earth in 20 million years. So actually, those same people, if you were to witness such an event today, they would say, well, it's a rock of a type that we've never seen right. before. Right. Uh, but they will not uh, admit that it could be technological in origin. They would just say, well, it, it's red because, you know, it, or most the asteroids are red. Yes. Or, if, you know, it, it has material strength that is tougher than iron meteorites, the way this uh, 2014 meteor was. They would right. argue, well, it's... Um, probably the data is not uh, accurate and it was not moving as fast as as, as we thought. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course they would. Of course they so, would. <sighs> okay. Now, yeah. moving on to other things. Uh, last year, you were very busy and uh, you had the opportunity of interviewing US Navy fighter pilot Ryan Graves, who allegedly saw unknown craft during a training exercise back in 2014. What was your impression of Ryan Graves and his story? Right. So he actually has a podcast. He interviewed me for a oh, few hours. God. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I did. A, I did have an. I did have a, a conversation with him, and uh. you know, my impression is that he's very sincere. He's professional. Mm. He's not a scientist. Okay, so he mm. saw uh, what he talks about was probably there. The question mm. is, was it <clears throat> um, related to espionage by some adversarial country or some? Uh, toys that the U.S. government is developing that didn't want, want him to know about. Um, but the, there were probably objects in the sky that uh, were not known to him and that behaved in ways that are not easy to interpret. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been drones. It could have been balloons. Uh, it could have been extraterrestrial in origin. Um, and so we don't, we don't really know because there is no record of that data. You see, that's the problem with there are two aspects to it. One, that uh, it's from the past, so we cannot easily revisit it. Uh, and second is that um, it's based on eyewitness testimony. Uh, you know, when uh, FIFA, the soccer organization, tries to decide if there was a goal in a controversial case, like in the Women's World Cup, uh, yeah. we all know that they use cameras to figure out the answer and are not using the players or the audience. And and that's the approach of science. You want to use instruments that provide you data without um, having an opinion. And unfortunately, we don't have access to that in the case of Ryan Graves. There are other cases where there was some video data, but it's not uh, conclusive. And I'm, you know, it's quite possible that the US government has much better data and they might have materials that they collected over decades because their job is 
to monitor the sky, to monitor the ground uh, in the US. And uh, as a result, they would come across things that might look unusual. And they might even have a unit that is trying to interpret what they're finding to figure out if it's, it was sent by a specific adversarial nation. So I'm sure they recovered things over the years, the, but these things are classified. They may have been uh, delegated, uh, given to corporations to examine outside government. Uh, unfortunately, they don't reveal that uh, information and I, I have no idea what they have. Uh, and you know, we could wait for them to, to dis disclose it uh, or we can try to collect it ourselves because the sky is not classified, the oceans are not classified, and scientists can do the job. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do with the Galileo project. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, Thursday, just in a few days, uh, I'm, there, there is an event on Capitol Hill um, um, that is titled, We Will Find Aliens, and then in parentheses, within the next decade. And uh, it features uh, a presentation that I will give and will bring uh, uh, important people from the DC, uh, Washington DC area. And uh, I hope uh, to learn something, but uh, this is a sort of an open discussion forum. It's, uh, it's not the way things are disclosed. And at the moment I, I know I have no evidence and I have no direct knowledge of uh, what the government has in its pos possession because they don't reveal it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, privy to that kind of information. There was an attempt by um, a senator, Sh the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, to uh, add an amendment to the uh, defense bill of last year, uh, in which uh, a new board would be established that would advise the U.S. presidents uh, about which uh, information to uh, disclose to the public about UAPs. So the idea was to have an, a board, an organization that is outside government looking into all the, the, uh, the available information within all branches of government and uh, deciding what to disclose. But that, um, that amendment was gutted and was not uh, approved. Um, and so that's unfortunate. But I say, well, you know, the US government has a day job, which is national security. They are not the ones to inform us what lies outside the solar system. You know, this is my day job as an astronomer. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to do. So uh, have you shifted slightly in terms of, you know, how you perceive someone like David Grush, for instance, since last we spoke? Uh, yeah, so I actually spoke with him. In his case, it was not a podcast. It was just a Zoom call that we had mm -hmm. for more than an hour in which uh, I tried to learn what what he is talking about and the thing is that you know i'm a scientist so i base my uh, views on on evidence i you know i, I cannot just believe something uh, because you know that's the realm of religion or maybe politics where you can have an opinion that is not substantiated by evidence that's legitimate in those areas but not in science, in science, I have to see something I have to know about. At the very least, I want to know specific details of of, of what he's talking about. Uh, and I asked him and he said that he's not allowed to reveal those things because they would have legal implications. So he didn't give me any, you know, uh, detail that is not publicly available to everyone else. Uh, and... Um, and moreover, the details that are available are not convincing, in my opinion. So, so um, we are left in the dark. Now, he was saying that there, there, the, the, there is a unit that, uh, for retrieval and reverse engineering of um, of um, crafts um, uh, that that were uh, found by the U.S. government that are from outside of this Earth, extraterrestrial. And uh, I just haven't seen any any evidence in, 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 that, that supports that. And so I don't know what to make of it. What is your opinion of the work of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office or ARA? <laughs> uh, um, yeah. and, and how is this different from previous official US attempts to come to grips with UFOs, UAPs, like you know, Project Sign, Grudge and Blue Book? Right. So um, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office was established in response to the first report from 
the director of national intelligence about UAPs. And by the way, now there is a, an initiative in Japan to look into UAPs as well, right. because it's a hotspot. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, in, so the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office started looking at past events. There were hundreds of them uh, that they looked at. Maybe by now it's approaching a thousand. Uh, and um, these are past reports, some of which are very far in, in the past, the decades ago, but some are more recent over the past decade. And in all cases, we were talking about uh, limited data that is available. And uh, they concluded that 97% of all these reports can be explained uh, in terms of uh, uh, things that we know about, like balloons or drones. Mm. Um, and then there are 3% or so uh, that are not uh, explainable in this way uh, because of lack of data, and it's not clear what these objects are. Uh, and so, you know, as far as they are concerned, perhaps they feel that they fulfill their their uh, man mandate uh, in the sense that uh, they are out there to figure out if um, if these were produced by adversarial countries and it's mainly a national security issue. And if if you understand uh, what most of the objects are, then uh, you know you did your job well. And uh, from the point of view of a scientist like myself, it's clear that uh, it's a mixed bag. It's clear that most of the objects, there is a lot of crap in the sky that humans yeah. produce, they're natural objects. And so the question from a scientific perspective uh, is whether one in a million or one in a billion of these objects might be extraterrestrial. And even if only one in a billion is, that would be big news for humanity. Oh, sure. And uh, it's a completely different perspective on this subject, the scientific versus the national security perspective. And that's why an organization like Arrow should not be the one to bring the news or to figure out uh, the scientific answer. Uh, that should be derived by observatories dedicated to monitoring the sky 24-7. And we have one um, at Harvard University that has been doing that over the past six months. We found um, of the order of half a million objects in the sky. None of them is anomalous. That's the sky over Boston. Um, right. And, um, you know, it may be a situation like uh, in real estate where uh, the three factors that matter the most are location, location, location. Mm -hmm. And so we just were in the wrong location. But the one thing we are doing is we monitor the sky all the time. So it's a systematic study of the sky. Uh, and it's not anecdotal the way that the, the military reports are, where someone happened to be at the right place at the right time. We watch the sky all the time, so we can tell what is the background uh, of known objects. And if something appears unusual, we would quantify how unusual it is because we, we are looking all the time. And this was never done before. Um, and now we are writing the first paper. Hopefully we'll, we'll uh, submit it for publication this summer. Uh, th that summarizes um, what we uh, found and puts uh, some limits on the appearance of UAPs during the time and uh, in the place that we looked uh, from. And uh, in addition to that, we are building a, another um, observatory in Colorado, and uh, we just got funded at $600,000 to uh, build a, a third copy of the observatory in um, Pennsylvania. The, the funding for that came from the Richard King Mellon Foundation. And um, so uh, we will have hopefully three observatories looking at different locations uh, at the sky, recording uh, images in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio from the entire sky at those locations. And, and those will be analyzed. We are already analyzing them with machine learning software to figure out whether we are looking at birds, airplanes, balloons, drones, familiar objects, or something else. And you know, once we have tens of millions of objects, we might actually have one that uh, looks really weird. And of course, we, uh, the public will be made aware of that if yeah. we find it. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus Podcast. And from the US, we're speaking with New York Times bestseller for his 2021 book, Extraterrestrial, and Frank B. Baird, Jr., Professor of Science at Harvard University, Boston, Avi Loeb. Avi, what were your thoughts on the US congressional hearings on UAP last year, where David Grush, Ryan Graves, and David Fravor gave their respective testimonies? 
I thought it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, these are, uh, at least, uh, you know, in the case of uh, uh, Ryan Graves and, and uh, uh, David Fravor, we know for sure that, you know, they, are, they were very accomplished uh, uh, military uh, people that, that um, noticed the unusual things. And and uh, I trust what they say. They, they seem reliable. They have the integrity of uh, telling the truth. And uh, we just don't know what these objects were. And that, that was the basis for the three reports that were submitted by the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haynes. And, and, and you know, there are two possible interpretations of, of those reports. Um, either the government admits that they're not doing their job. You know, the, the intelligence agencies are supposed to know what's in the sky. Mm -hmm. And if they confess that they cannot understand some UAPs, you know, that's a, a startling uh, confession because, no. you know, it, 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 it implies that they're not uh, doing their job if that is a matter of national security. And uh, the other possibility, if it's not a matter of national security, if, if these objects are from outside Earth, uh, then it's even more startling because for, for from a scientific perspective, it's the first evidence that we are not alone. Uh, and um, therefore, you know, I find those reports uh, quite remarkable. And I asked uh, Avril Haynes when I was with her in the green room uh, at the Washington National Cathedral. I asked her, uh, "You have a PhD, uh, you have a bachelor's degree in, in physics from the University of Chicago, and so we speak the same language. What do you make of these objects in your reports?" And mm -hmm. and she said, "I don't know," <laughs> and uh, I believed that I believed yeah. her. So. I think um, I think it's really uh, interesting that there are these reports now. Uh, with respect to Grash, that was the most uh, unusual testimony because he was talking about specific programs yeah. uh, that may have Grash materials. And uh, you know, I, I would love the government to disclose uh, the knowledge of what they have, and or at least the materials, and we can look into them scientifically. Uh, because I don't think uh, that anything that came from outside the solar system is a matter of national security. It, it shouldn't be uh, something held uh, uh, from the public's eye. It should be a subject of scientific study that is shared by all humans. You know, the, this is something that all of us should be aware of because knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge should not be forbidden uh, as was in the days of uh, Copernicus and Galileo, you know, now yeah. we know that we benefited greatly from knowing that the Earth is not at the center because we can visit Mars. If we thought that Mars moves around the Earth, we would never get to our destination. And yeah. so it's really important to know the reality that we live in, our cosmic neighborhood. If we do have a neighbor and if we are being visited, we should know about it. Uh, as much as that would be a psychological shock that we might not be the smartest um, you know, in in in, in the neighborhood, um, we we need to know that, uh, and we need to know that we have neighbors because uh, that would um, change the way we plan ahead. Maybe it will give us new aspirations for space. Um, so I just think it's inappropriate for the U.S. government to keep anything under wraps uh, if it's clear that it was not human made. Uh, but I and obviously if they have it, it will save me decades of my own research. Why, you know, why should I waste the rest of my life when they already have the evidence? So, so I really hope that they will release it or at least part of it, at least the part that that is very old that that has nothing to do with present day technologies that adversarial countries have. So, um, and if they don't have it, you know, let. Then, then fine. Uh, we just uh, need to move on. Um, but we need to know what's what's uh, in possession of government. And of course, this board that the Schumer amendment meant to establish would go to the bottom of it. Uh, yeah. But now we, it doesn't exist. So maybe there will be a new initiative in the coming fiscal year. We shall see. Uh, maybe uh, I will be able to advocate for that in the event that I'm going to in Washington, D.C., just in a few days. Which is... well, while in Munich, you were asked by your interviewer about Hollywood versions of aliens. And I know that you're not a sci-fi guy, but our, in our fictional imaginings, we seem to be forming a sort of mirroring effect where we superimpose human characteristics onto non-human entities. 
I mean, is this simply a lack of imagination in astrobiology, or is it designed to conf uh, comfort us from the idea that aliens are so vastly different from us and so superior to us that they don't harbor any of our foibles like, you know, violence, for instance? I mean, in effect, we like the idea that an alien is like us, you know, on level pegging, so we can outmaneuver it and perhaps even defeat it in battle, right? Yeah, so first I should break the news that uh, we already have aliens uh, in our society. These are the AI systems that we are using. <laughs> I mean, they are our technological kids. Uh, but just like with my daughters, you know, uh, even though I was responsible for their existence, uh, they can outsmart me. And uh, those technological children, the technological products, uh, AI systems that we produce, the large language models uh, in the form of chat GPT, uh, in the very near future would uh, outsmart us. Um, uh, they would perform uh, some tasks much better than humans. Uh, but of course, other tasks, they might uh, not perform as well as humans. And you know, some uh, complain that uh, they hallucinate well, I work with summer interns that hallucinate very often. Uh, and so I don't see that as a big uh, deficiency. Uh, but the thing to remember is that they are made of silicon, these AI systems, and uh, we are made of flesh and blood. And therefore, they would never be like us. Now, we can train them on uh, uh, the internet, content that was produced by humans, but they're not uh, operating the way we our brain operates. And and um, when people ask me about consciousness and free will, I, I often say that these are emergent phenomena uh, for, of complex uh, uh, systems, um, uh, the human brains. Uh, and uh, it's just a matter of complexity. The number of synapses in the human brain is a, a, a quadrillion. And they connect uh, 100 billion uh, neurons. Um, and, um, and, and so uh, when the number of connections in the neural networks of uh, uh, large language models we, uh, is reaching the same uh, level of complexity as, as the human brain, uh, that system would start to show up the same qualitative features that we assign to consciousness and free will. I, I'm quite confident of that because, you know, we, are, we, we mapped the, the brain, the wirings of the brain of a, a fruit fly uh, th there was a paper about that last year, and uh, you know it, it, it's half a million neurons, uh, uh, sorry, half a million uh, uh, synapses, and and and, uh, uh, and 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 so it was. It's possible to uh, in in very primitive uh, life forms. It's possible for us to even simulate it, okay, and and see how it operates. And there is nothing more than those connections. Uh, in the neural networks that uh, does the operation of processing data from the environment that is very rich. So when you have a very rich environment combined with uh, a, a complex brain, like the human brain, you get phenomena that you cannot really forecast. And you can assign a name to those phenomena in, at a meta level and call them consciousness or, or call them free will. But it's actually the, the system is unpredictable just because it has a large number of degrees. Written. It is exposed to an environment that is not uh, documented. And so you end up getting things that you cannot forecast. Uh, maybe only statistically you can forecast them. Um, and, and on top of that, just keep in mind that in, in modern physics, there is the, the concept of chaos and the, the concept of quantum mechanics. I mean, the, the, uh, the chemical process in the human brain are... Uh, ruled by quantum mechanics that uh, introduces an uncertainty to the predictions. They, they can only be, uh, you know, uh, elementary particles can only be uh, specified uh, to a certain level of uh, uncertainty by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And, and so you put this all together and it's clear why the system is not predictable if it's very complex. And uh, so, um, so we already have those aliens, the, the silicon-based artificial intelligence systems that we produce. And of course, the next, uh, uh, the, the other type of uh, aliens would be coming from another star or other stars. And, and they could be extraterrestrial AI systems. And we might need our own AI systems to figure them out. 
Uh, yeah. So we will have our own uh, AI and, uh, and uh, interacting with extraterrestrial AI that could be far more advanced than our AI. Uh, and, and so that, you know, that, that interaction is sort of a, a modern uh, version of um, the imitation game that Alan Turing thought about uh, 90 years ago, yeah. except now it's not imitation of humans by the machine, it's imitation of extraterrestrial AIs by uh, terrestrial AIs. System. It's a, uh, it's a mind blowing concept. Uh, concept, it really is. I mean, um, I, I just had this thought, and it's just so weird. I mean, imagine if you will that there is a group of aliens, sort of like us, maybe a little bit more intelligent than us, maybe by a thousand years or a million years, who are quantum entangled with us. And somehow, when we have a scientist sitting down thinking, you know what, I think I'm going to get up and write a paper on AI and machine learning, it's actually a, a, it's, it's actually a message being received via quantum entanglement through the brain that allows them to actually put down this thing. So wouldn't it be incredible to think that quantum entanglement is a form of communication that we're not consciously aware of that then allows us to build the very AI which they themselves have probably created and thought about. I mean, the universe, I don't know. It's all yeah. too well, much. Well, the, <laughs> uh, the, only, the only issue is that we are, I mean, the human brain uh, and us are very big objects that yeah. contain a, a very large number of particles. So uh, when we do quantum entanglement experiments, usually these are simple systems that maintain coherence. And um, when you deal with a lot of particles that are not in a coherent state, you end up with a classical object, an object that behaves just uh, the way that classical physics described it as deterministic. Uh, and it, it's simply a result of um, having too many particles to keep them uh, in, in phase with each other. Uh, and so it's hard to imagine how you would maintain coherence for macroscopic big big objects like ourselves like our mm. body like our brain but you know i should say there is a lot we don't understand about physics we don't mm. understand what most of the matter in the universe is 84 percent of it is of a substance that we've never witnessed we call it yeah. dark matter we don't yeah. understand what the vacuum is made of we call it dark energy mm. And, you know, these constitute 95% of the mass budget in the present day universe. And we don't know what happened before the Big Bang. We don't know what, what's inside a black hole. Um, there are lots of, I mean, these are the things we realize that we don't know. These are the known unknowns. But, you know, we just have one century of uh, modern physics. Quantum mechanics was discovered exactly a century ago. Uh, and so um, it just you know the, the the what we know the the knowledge the scientific knowledge that we possess is an island in an ocean of ignorance and no. if another civilization had uh, a thousand years of science and technology or a, a millennium um uh or maybe a million years or a billion years just imagine how much more advanced they are than compared to us and i don't think it's a threat uh that's why i don't like science fiction and uh, i really prefer to approach it scientifically i do yeah. i do think that uh, i do think that um the job description of god you know which basically says it's an entity that is super has superhuman intelligence that can create a universe and can also create life if you just read the first chapter of the old testament the bible that's the job you can think of it as a job definition of of god okay mm -hmm. and uh, i would say that is potentially feasible to do these tasks can be done by sufficiently advanced science if you have uh, an, an understanding of quantum gravity you can uh, perhaps produce a baby universe in the laboratory okay and if you know uh, um, uh, the chemistry of life you can produce life in the laboratory so a sufficiently advanced scientific culture is a good approximation to god and we would be filled with religious awe uh, if we were to encounter them just the way moses uh, when he encountered the burning bush that was never consumed was very impressed and today we can buy online gadgets that would have impressed moses as much uh, yeah. And they don't cost a lot of money. It's just a, a sign of our technology that is more advanced than he was witnessing. Uh, and so, um, I, you know, it's even possible that our own universe was produced in the laboratory of an advanced scientist. Uh, 
Following on from that, Avi, just uh, quickly, the idea of super intelligent alien life and its science combined with our notions of creation mythology through religion, do you think that there would be a time upon knowing 100% that there is super intelligent life out there, that somehow science and religion will actually come together in a unification of sorts? Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. I think that um, in the future, if we encounter a more a, a superhuman intelligence uh, from outer space, mm -hmm. uh, it you know we would be filled with religious awe at the uh, abilities of that uh, entity, and uh, moreover, uh, we could see tangible evidence for it. it you know, in the form of things that look miraculous to us that we cannot imagine based on our knowledge of science. And, uh, you know, that's not very different than the, what you find in, in religious texts. And the other connection is that uh, in traditional religions, there is this concept of the Messiah that brings uh, peace and prosperity to earth. And uh, in, my, in my book, the Messiah, the, such a message would uh, come from another star. OK, that uh, yeah. we would realize that there is a better way. Uh, we, we need to change our priorities instead of fighting each other on territories. There are two wars right now uh, yeah. ongoing on territories on this rock. And if, if you think about it, it's ridiculous. This is a piece of rock left behind from the formation of the sun. And uh, there is so much real estate in outer space that it's really ridiculous to, for us to shorten our lifespan from a hundred, you know, most of us live less than a hundred years to, to shorten it even more by engaging in wars and conflicts. And instead, you know, it may open our eyes to a much better uh, path uh, of uh, collaboration and uh, peace and prosperity. And this message, this messenger, this Messiah may actually come from interstellar space. And it could be a robot. Oh. <laughs> 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 That's Abby. what I'm saying. Yes, it could be. <laughs> Avi, thank you for being with us again and for sharing your insights on The Focus. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Frank B. Beard, Junior Professor of Science at Harvard University, Avi Loeb. And to our audience, thanks for tuning into The Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find The Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages and on Twitter, or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the Media Center drop-down menu and hitting podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks to our store award production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart and to the team at the Oscast Network. We hope that you'll join us again as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni and from Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus.